Careful of the careful accord there.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the Schneider Theater here at Bloomington Civic Plaza and to this town hall forum with Congressman Dean Phillips. Glad to see everyone here tonight. My name is Tim Bussey. I have the honor and the pleasure of serving as mayor of the city of Bloomington. And I also have the honor and pleasure of serving as the moderator tonight. So very happy to be here. Very happy to see you, to see faces that are not on little boxes on a screen, that are actually in front of me. And I really do appreciate that. I can promise you that the five words that you will not hear tonight are, I think you're still on mute. It's not going to happen anytime tonight. Very happy about that. I, I, see some, I see some familiar faces. I see some new faces. Uh, glad to see you all. Just a quick show of hands. Who here is, is a Bloomington resident? Very nice. Who here is a resident of another city in the Minnesota 3rd? Who here is a resident outside the Minnesota 3rd and wishes you belonged in the Minnesota 3rd, right? I knew it. I knew that was the case. I knew that was the case. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for being here on this gorgeous summer evening. The Congressman generally does this. I hope each of you received a, a note card on your way in with an opportunity to write down a question in the, on the note card. And the big fishbowl, and there's some extra note cards. If you want one, please uh, wait your hand and uh, staff will bring them around and they'll also collect a question that is a duplicate or repeats an earlier question. We'll acknowledge that, but we're going to try and uh, move on from that question and try and get you as many different questions as we possibly can tonight. So that's what we'll be doing uh, in terms of the questions. Uh, we'll get started here just very quickly. We're going to take the final question at 710, and we're out of here at 715. And then we're all headed over to the Mall of America at the M&M store. They're waiting for us. <laughs> the first round is on Representative Elkins right here. So. so you all know that uh, Dean Phillips is a, he's a father, he's a civic leader, he is an eternal optimist, and he is a representative from Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District. He's also a gold star son who lost his birth father, Artie, in the Vietnam War. In Congress, Dean is focusing on restoring Americans' faith in government. Dean is vice chair of the, uh, the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus and is a member of the House Ethics, Small Business, and Foreign Affairs Committee, as well as the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. In, in June, Dean was recognized for his efforts by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce with the Jefferson Hamilton Award for Bipartisanship and was recently ranked the 12th most bipartisan member of the House by the Liberal Senate. Dean is all of those things, and what he absolutely is, is a staunch and fierce proponent for the Minnesota 3rd Congressional District. And we see that here in Bloomington and are very happy and proud about it. The last week of June, the Minnesota Department of Transportation received that they had announced, uh, they announced that they received a, uh, a federal grant of $60 million from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Infrastructure for Rebuilding America Grant Program. It's to help fund the 494 project, which will go basically from 169 to the airport. So you have much needed funds for a much needed project. And I can tell you, it would not have happened without the support of Congressman Phillips. Senators Klobuchar, Senator Smith, they all tag team. It's a team sport, and they work so very well together. This is the largest grant that the Minnesota Department of Transportation has ever received and we will all benefit from it, all of us in the 3rd District, certainly the folks across Minnesota who use 494, but the people who live and work along 494 from Clinton all the way down to the airport will benefit enormously from these improvements that are going to happen in 494. So, uh, as I said, that wouldn't have happened without the support of Congressman Phillips. With that, without any further ado, please welcome this evening the representative from Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District, Dean Phillips. Importantly, this is a beautiful site, uh, a site for sore eyes, uh, probably more so for me than for all of you because you've got to look at me, but uh, what a year it's been. Uh, about a year and a half since I've been face to face with so many of you. Uh, a terrible year, many of you probably have lost loved ones or friends or have suffered because of COVID. Uh, I have you on my mind and in my heart. Uh, no matter your politics, no matter the issues most important to you, no matter if you support me or not, uh, I love you all, and I love representing this district. Uh, Minnesota's third is one of the most important districts in the entire country, and if the country is going to succeed, I would argue it's because of people like you in this room that actually take the time to come out, sit with one another, uh, and listen to your congressperson, challenge him, uh, 
take them to task sometimes. Uh, and I appreciate that. I love representing you, and I want you to know how much it means to me. And I know there's a lot to be fearful about. COVID, of course, we're still uh, going through the pandemic and the Delta variant and other variants that are circulating around the world uh, will certainly pose threats to Americans and other countries. Uh, the wildfires and heat that we're seeing in, in the West clearly, uh, in no small part due to climate change, uh, is concerning to all of us. Uh, economic insecurity, uh, where we stand on the world stage, there's a lot to be concerned about. Our democracy itself. If there's one thing, if there's one thing I've learned more than anything else in my now two and a half years in Congress, it's that democracy is fragile, even right here in the United States of America. I was never taught that. I was taught that we were exceptional, we are exceptional. I was taught that our democracy is solid. But that is contingent upon people participating and caring uh, and being principled. Uh, and there's an absence of that, as you all know, in, in too many corners of Congress and throughout the country right now. Uh, my personal mission is simply to get people to talk and listen to one another, share our life experiences, understand why we look at things differently. I'm gonna separate the lack of principle from the passion on issues that are important to all of you. And as we proceed tonight, I will answer your questions directly and honestly, uh, and I hope to continue to serve you uh, all with integrity. Uh, but before I start, I printed some numbers on these little cards. I'm gonna start with, I've got about 10 of them. 1,207, that's the number of cases uh, that my extraordinary staff here in Minnesota and Washington um, have opened on behalf of constituents, some of you perhaps in this room, in the Minnesota Congressional District with federal agencies. 1,207 people have called us with help with Social Security or veterans benefits, uh, the IRS, you name it, passports, which I know are awfully tough right now. Uh, 1,207 of you uh, we have helped. 5,859,242. That's how many dollars we've helped return to residents of Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District through our advocacy, $5,859,242. That used to be a lot of money. <laughs> Nine, that's the number of bills I've introduced so far in 2021. 41 is how many I've introduced since I started serving in Congress in the last two and a half years. Nine and 41. 24. It's how many public events we've had. My predecessor wasn't terribly fond of getting in front of the public. I told you, I promised you that I would do so. I love it. 24 events in the last two and a half years. Of course, some of the recent ones were virtual, but I gotta tell you, I am so psyched to be back in front of you face to face. 24. 1,144. That's how many meetings and community events I've attended since being sworn in in 2019. 1,144. It seems like 1,200. I like the laughter, thank you. All right, 51. That's how many school visits and meetings with superintendents and teachers I've had in the last two and a half years. Learning about what I need to learn about our education system. And I'm hopeful that there might even be some questions about that tonight. Eight. 80. It's funny, from this side it looks like eight. <laughs> 80, that's how many companies, many of them small businesses, some of them large in our district, and chamber events I've attended in the last two and a half years. 80, including an extraordinary one today. Uh, 310,000, that's how many responses we've issued to constituents that have written us or called us or emailed us. Some of them friendly, some of them not so friendly, but 310,000 responses. And I promise you, if we are, if you write us or you contact us uh, and you do not get a response, I want to know about it. I think we've got the most extraordinary team in Congress, the best constituent services imaginable. Are we perfect? No. But do we in, uh, inspire, aspire to reach every single person that contacts us? Absolutely. And I promise you, we will. 12 out of 435. I'm the 12th most bipartisan member of Congress out of 435 people. My promise to you is that I'd get to know my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, uh, that I'd work with them, uh, that I'd do my utmost to look at perspectives uh, that may not be the ones that I brought to Congress, but that I've learned from. Uh, and the Luger Center has named me the 12th most bipartisan member 
of Congress. But I gotta tell you, that little round of applause probably means more than anything else, because bipartisan isn't very cool right now. The far right, the far left doesn't reward it, as you all know. Uh, so thank you very sincerely from the bottom of my heart for still appreciating the fact that what we learn in kindergarten about working with one another still means something. One of eight, uh, I was named the most effective legislator in the Minnesota delegation of our eight members of Congress by the Center for Effective Law. experience to be a good representative, right? Uh, one out of 435, this is all of you, the highest voter turnout district in the United States. I don't know where we stand in parking ticket payments. <laughs> and my staff asked me to put this one up, uh, 43,000. That's how many of you have signed up for our news updates. So if you're not one of those people and want to be informed, sign up and become the 43,001st person to join our email list. And with that, my friends, I just want to tell you once again how psyched I'm going to be with all of you. Uh, I didn't realize how much I rely on human interaction uh, to fuel myself uh, in a really difficult job at a really difficult time in our nation's history. Uh, to be with all of you again uh, means a lot to me. Uh, and we have come out the other side. It's not going to be easy yet. Uh, we'll have some tough days and probably some dark ones yet. Uh, but we stuck together. Uh, and Minnesotans, as we typically do, took care of one another. Uh, we're ahead on vaccination rates of a lot of our peer states around the country. Uh, and we're showing the country, I think, how you can do it and should do it. And I hope we maintain that. So on behalf of all of you and everyone in Minnesota, thank you, because you inspire me. Uh, and I love you all. So with that. I believe in transparency, uh, that is a duplicate, uh, will we pass up and go on to the next one. And we'll try to answer as many as possible, and, uh, and I appreciate all of those of you who submitted a new question. Our first question. Our first question is from Pam Allen in Bloomington. Why is a congressional seat for only two years? So little time and so much money to run. Has anyone proposed making it a four-year term? And for you, could it be for life? <laughs> First of all, I believe in term limits, so no. Uh, I believe in them more so now that I serve in Congress than, than ever. Uh, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, running for office every two years is not easy. You know, but I would argue, by serving as a good representative and getting around your community and, and working hard and, and listening well, you know, that's running, too. And I, I've struggled with this because what troubles me more than the running for office every two years or the, the election cycle, it's the focus on the money. If you notice, every article about campaigns right now is about how much money someone raises. And by the way, do you see who raises the most money? The most antagonistic, divisive, mean-spirited people in the United States Congress raise the most money. We have the most perverse incentive system in the entire world as it comes, when it comes to politics. The more bombastic, angry, divisive, mean-spirited you are, the bigger your fundraising numbers, and frankly, the more followers you get on Twitter. And that's how the stupid game works. But I thought about it. Thank goodness we have two-year terms. Thank goodness. Because when, a, when our government uh, is in one-party control, which generally I don't necessarily favor, I'm pleased right now because I think we're going to accomplish some good things, but it allows the country to share an opinion in the middle of a pre presidential term. I think that's really important. And that there's a reason our, our founders, I think, had great intention to have four-year presidential terms, six-year Senate terms, and two-year um, terms in Congress. You know, we're the people's house for a reason. The only way you can serve in the United States Congress is to win an election. You cannot be appointed. Senators can be appointed. Even the vice president can become the president. But you have got to be elected to the people's house. So I think it's actually really important. And yes, it's frustrating. I don't think we should change the two-year terms. What I think we should change is the sickening and repulsive and corrupting influence of the money in the politics. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I put some of my own money in my first campaign. And I found it sickening that I had to do so. But I was taking on a five-term incumbent who was the, like the third biggest PAC recipient in the entire Congress. And $24 million were spent in our race. It was appalling. I didn't put any in last time. 
and hope not to do so ever again. I don't think it should, uh, Congress should be simply populated with people of means. I don't think Congress should be populated with people who are divisive and raise millions of dollars. I don't think Congress should be populated based on how much access to money you have, period. That's what I think. And I think that's a, I think that's a beautiful intersection between Republicans and Democrats. Everyone is disgusted by it. 10,000 hours per week is what my colleagues spend raising money, dialing for dollars, running across the street every 15 minute break we have between votes to make five more phone calls, missing, missing committee markups and votes because they're doing fundraising events, raising money during the day when you are paying our salaries. It really pisses me off. And it's disgusting, it's apolitical, because both parties do it, and the industrial political complex and the duopoly is a real problem in our country, and I'm not gonna lie to you. And that's something I really do hope to address. Question from Jennifer Tepley from Carver. Do you have any optimism regarding the border crisis? What is being discussed regarding plan of action? Well, I'm an optimist by nature. And the border is challenging. I've been to the border twice. Uh, it's heartbreaking. Uh, and I saw in front of my eyes uh, the same horrors that you probably see on, on television screens uh, of, of young parents with small children crossing the Rio Grande uh, for the same reason that many of our respective ancestors came to this country, which is to find a better life, uh, more opportunity, safety and security, and possibility. Uh, I saw Border Patrol agents who have been demeaned by a lot on the left, frankly, uh, show compassion that was unbelievable to me. Taking care of babies whose names they did not know and whose parents were not around. And if you are a human being, it would be hard not to be affected by it. What sickens me is it's politicized. You know, Democrats politicized it you know, a couple years ago, and now Republicans are doing the same thing. The fact of the matter is no Democrat or Republican administration has done a good job on this. And the sad truth is, uh, I serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee. We, we talk regularly about how we use our foreign aid dollars. We're not very good in our own backyard. And the fact is, in the Northern Triangle countries, uh, you know, we've got an exodus of people who are simply fleeing because life is so miserable. And the greatest nation on earth with the great resources that we have, I think, should be using our resources to create stability and possibility and safety uh, and opportunity in the countries from which these immigrants are coming. Because if we did that, we would save money, we would save lives, we would save heartbreak. The answer is not a wall. There are areas of the border where absolutely we should be improving the security. The real problem is that we're using 40, 50-year-old facilities at the border in which people have to wait in a line literally a mile long. People who come from Mexico to work in the United States every day have to wait, wait in hot, sun, searing sunshine a mile long every day. Uh, trucks, semi-trailers, stretched as far as the eye can see because of the inefficiencies at our border. Uh, it's heartbreaking. Uh, so that I am optimistic, but I don't have an answer for you right now because until we go way upstream, and make life better for those who are fleeing to come to our country right now, we're not going to stop it. We have a huge border. And you know what, if you build a wall along the southern border, you know, the criminal gangs that are they're, they're charging these people six, seven, eight thousand dollars per person, their entire life savings just to get them across the border, you don't think they're just gonna get on boats and come up to Florida or along the eastern seaboard or somewhere quiet along the California coast? The answer is not a border. You know, I mean, not a border wall. The answer is secure borders where we can, thoughtful processing systems, and most importantly, better lives for people who feel that they, their only chance is to come here illegally. Uh, so we've got to come together on this. And as long as leaders in both parties um, simply politicize it, and the question is open borders or closed borders and binary, uh, we're not going to make any progress. Uh, I would ask that all of you think about this because you know, uh, most of us come from an immigrant background. Most of us have great-grandparents, or even further beyond that, who came here to escape something or to look for something better. And America is an idea. Ronald Reagan himself said, you can move to England and you're never gonna be a Brit. You can move to Germany, you're not gonna be a German. You can move to Paris, you're not gonna be a Frenchman. But anybody in the world can move to the United States of America and you're an American. 
And that's why I wish our country would start focusing on that a little bit more and show a little bit more compassion and work together. Question from Lori Palmer from Bloomington. Isn't there a way to establish a voter ID law that could be simple, free, fair, and totally accessible for all and would satisfy both the right and the left? I think absolutely. Perfect time in our history is right now where we should be con you know, considering reforms to our voting standards. So we have baselines. I mean, COVID, as we all know, forced states to completely change uh, how we vote, most of the time making it more accessible. And frankly, uh, I think many of those things we should continue. Early voting and absentee voting and, uh, and the like. You know, what I'm concerned about is certain states are um, using a big lie to simply pass legislation that is both unnecessary and, if anything, disenfranchising. And if there's anything core to being an American, it should be easy access to vote. I mean, if any country in the world, if any country in the world any country in the world should be focused on access to the ballot, making it easier, not harder. It should be the United States of America. What does it send, what message does it send to the rest of the world when the United States is making it harder to vote? A bad one, I would argue. Now that said, I want safe and secure elections. Minnesota is one of the best in the country at doing it. And I think if we can find some thoughtful baseline improvements uh, uh, for voting standards, not to federalize elections, simply to have baselines. Same way we do everything else in this country. Federal laws pass, states have flexibility, but there's a baseline, an expectation of how you do things. Uh, and I do think it's time to look at some type of a voter ID. And the easiest way to do that, I think, is the last four digits of your social security number. Not everybody has a photo ID. My great grand, my grandfather, Mort Phillips, who passed away four years ago, he did not have a photo ID. You know, he was bedridden for the last few years of his life. He wanted to vote. He couldn't vote based on some of the standards being proposed around the country. I'm sure many of you in your own families, if not some of you personally, don't have a photo ID. But you're an American, and you should be able to vote. So all we have to do is use the last four digits of our social security number that can be matched in a federal database because if you're an American citizen, you have a social security number. I think it can be as simple as that. So yes, we should consider it. It's not a stupid notion. To the contrary, it's actually a thoughtful one. But it's gotta be coupled with making access easier. And right now, access to get a, a picture ID for a lot of people, especially in rural areas, uh, the elderly, the infirm, those with physical challenges, it's hard. And it's kind of like our legal system. I think if we disenfranchise one legal voter from being able to cast his or her ballot, shame on us. The same way you know, that we have a system of justice where we'd rather see um, a guilty person go free than someone who's not guilty be put in prison. It's the same notion to me, and I think it's possible. Sarah Eichstadt with the Borgen Project, Project from Coon Rapids. Thank you for supporting poverty reduction legislation. I was wondering how you plan to encourage your colleagues to support these bills and what other actions you will take to restore American leadership in the issue of global poverty. Well, today is a big day in that, uh, to that end. Uh, $300, up to $300 per month in a child tax credit, as you all know, starting uh, right now. Uh, if, you may, if you're a family that earns less than $150,000 a year uh, and you have children, uh, you're eligible for a tax credit. It should, be, it should be literally hitting bank accounts right now. We intend to reduce child poverty in the United States by about 50%, by 50%. Now, I believe in equal opportunity. I know there are going to be different outcomes in the United States. But I don't think kids should pay the price on that. I think the adults should pay the price on that. Kids should not pay the price if their parents can't provide for them. And back to being America, what do we stand for? What are our basic principles and our fundamentals? My goodness, if it's not taking care uh, of children and the elderly, I don't know what we stand for. So to that end, as you all know, uh, there's a massive uh, uh, budget proposition that the Biden administration has just announced that would transform lives for the most disadvantaged in this country for generations in the way that uh, the New Deal did. Probably nothing as big since then. Uh, and I would argue that if we do so, we will save money down the road. 
If we afford um, early childhood education to children, evidence indicates that crime is reduced by up to 60% in that cohort. If we provide a child tax, tax credit, so there's a little bit more money in the pockets of families that don't have much that they can use to help their children, that's helpful. Uh, paid family leave, uh, 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 child care, you know, so that, that, that mothers or fathers can go out and actually work and be self-sufficient while their kids are being looked after. Because right now, as you all know, Minnesota is one of the highest cost states in the country for child care. The child tax credit, 120,000 kids in our district, and Minnesota's third, one of the most prosperous districts in the entire nation. 120,000 kids are going to benefit. 70% of the families in our district are going to get an uh, average of $2,500. So they have a little more to take care of their kids. You know, those are the, those, that's the low-hanging fruit. And each of us can do something to help. You know, philanthropy to me is not just uh, writing a check to the United Way and hoping that you do good with it. The highest form of philanthropy is giving someone a job or giving someone a chance or opening a door for them or, or helping them become self-sufficient. That's what I think America's all about. That's where you blend the beautiful uh, conservative notions with more liberal notions. Let's take care of those that can't take care of themselves and let's have policies that encourage self-sufficiency. And I think we should come together on that. Uh, and we can, we should lead the world. And I will tell you, you'll hear a theme tonight as I talk about policy. We're in a competition. America used to be the clear winner in just about every category of success. Strongest military, best schools, you know, highest uh, median and, and average incomes in the world, safety, security, prosperity, natural resources. Well, uh, we've been resting on our laurels for a long time. And a lot of countries are passing us by. Their kids are being better educated. They're better taken care of. They've got better health care. We pay $10,000 per person for health care in America, and our, and our uh, outcomes are mid-path. Mid-path. So we got a lot of catching up to do. And if every one of you in the room, no matter your politics, agree on one thing, I hope it's that America should lead the world. We should be the most prosperous. We should be the land of opportunity. We should have the best education, the best health care. And we should not have one child who goes to sleep hungry, for goodness gracious. Richard Laybourne from Bloomington asked, a lot of Bloomington questions. The question is simply political system. Yes. In 20 words or less, yes. such infighting, factions had formed, which were becoming political parties, and he knew then that it could lead to the downfall of this great experiment for which so many spilled blood. Uh, and that's where we find ourselves right now. I'm a Democrat, I'm a proud Democrat, but I'm a troubled Democrat, because I'm a troubled American about our political system. We have a political industrial complex. It is a massive industry, $14 billion raised and spent in the last federal election cycle. We have two parties that fight each other to the bottom instead of elevating each other to the top. We have two parties that win by obstruction, you know, constantly win by obstruction or by division or by using fear to win elections. Uh, I personally think our country would be well served by a third party, at least a third party. I come from the business world. My successes in business have been taking on industries in which two big brands are constantly fighting their way to the bottom. 
And I think, frankly, it's time for the political industrial complex to have competition as well, because I think conservatives would agree. Competition makes people better, makes you more efficient, makes you more effective. Uh, so I think we need something. Now, I would argue, in the meantime, we could do some things. Ranked choice voting actually works. The most moderate candidate tends to win ranked choice voting elections. Of course, if someone breaks 50%, they win the election outright. But if not, it forces candidates who want to win to broaden their reach. It makes them reach out to the other side. It makes them go beyond where they're based by living. That is one way to help. Gerrymandering would help as well. If you represent, say, Minnesota's 5th District, right next door to me, you can do anything you want. You're going to be elected as long as you want in a deep blue district. The same way some of my friends across the aisle in the deep red districts, they can do anything they want because they're going to win with 60% of the vote every time. They don't have to listen to the 40%. We need more districts like the 3rd District. We need more districts like ours. They're competitive. I gotta show up. I can't rest. Yeah. I gotta listen to people. I gotta, I gotta represent. I gotta get out to the parts of the district that aren't terribly friendly. And those are the highlights of my days. We need more districts like this one. Gerrymandering, ranked choice voting are near term steps we can take. But we have a system designed by the two parties to keep it that way. And I wanna tell you another thing about Congress. We collectively don't determine the rules of Congress. The two parties do. The reason Congress doesn't work isn't because our founders weren't smart and didn't prepare uh, for, uh, I think, the most outstanding government system in the world. The fact is the two parties have taken over. They set the rules. That's why it doesn't work. And if we really want to see some change, it takes competition. And I think the question is a really important one. I think it's one this country should be thinking about a lot right now. Question from Brent Pavia from the Bloomington Chamber. Tell us about your work on the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Ah. So I serve on four committees. Another little, I'll give you a little another snapshot of what's so strange about Congress. I serve on four committees. Most people serve on two. Each committee has generally subcommittees. So I serve on a number of those too. Uh, there's not a lot of time in the day. And a lot of times, I've got two or three committee hearings scheduled at one time. I spent 12 hours this past week just on a foreign affairs committee, what we call a markup, where we vote on every amendment to bills. 12 hours, if you can imagine that. And my favorite committee that I serve on, by far, is the Committee on Modernization. It's called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Select, whenever you hear the word select in front of the committee, that means the Speaker of the House selects the members. In this case, the Democratic members, the Minority Leader selects the Republican members. The Modernization Committee, as you would expect, is um, uh, charged with trying to improve how Congress functions. And believe it or not, Democrats and Republicans on this group really like each other. And we're totally in agreement about 95% of what's coming before us. You would be amazed. The problem is you don't see it on MSNBC or Fox News or Newsmax or any of the other networks because it doesn't, it, we're not fighting each other. We're not divisive. We're not pounding our fists on the table. We're not doing stupid things. We're actually doing good work, which isn't terribly exciting, unfortunately. Uh, but we're going to make some big changes to empower rank and file members so that you can make amendments more easily, return to regular order, compensate our staffs better. People, they're working their tails off for the most meager, meager incomes you can possibly imagine. And we lose some extraordinarily talented public servants because of how poor that is. Interns, you know, we're gonna, we have to start attracting more diverse interns from around the country, not just race and religion, but geography. Because a lot of kids can't come to, to, to Washington, D.C. for a summer and have to pay the rents you gotta pay in Washington, right? We're gonna try to improve our intern system so we have a better bench of public servants, Democrats, Republicans, maybe even others. Uh, we're trying to change the technology. You would think that we'd be the most highly advanced uh, organization or institution in the world. Uh, sorry, my friends, I got a pager. <laughs> I got a, I, I'm not kidding, I got a pager handed to me on day one, I leave it on my credenza just to, so when, especially when young people come in my office, they ask what it is. <laughs> but I'm, I'm being honest with you, you know, we are a 20, we're living in a 21st century world and we are a 19th century institution and we've got to catch up. The Modernization Committee is a grand slam possibility. 
not just because of what we're working on and, and how important it is, it's because Democrats and Republicans are unified. And I encourage you to tune in. Uh, we, we broadcast our hearings. Uh, we're looking at some great ideas. And the most important idea, uh, one of which I feel so strongly about and I propose, is that our orientation program in Congress is non-existent, I would argue. Little bits of things here and there, but instead of getting us to sit down, new members of Congress, get to know each other, share our life stories so we understand where our perspectives are and why we come to them, uh, build some trust, do a ropes course or something, go to dinner. What happens? We're put on different buses, going to different events, and systematic separation begins on day one because that's how Democrats and Republicans maintain the power structure. They don't want new members to get to know each other. They don't want new members to have a lot of time on their hands because that's going to be a challenge to the power. And by the way, we've removed one person from her committees. And you see what happened? She's got all this free time now to be even more challenging for the country, right? They want to keep us busy, generally. That's the whole notion. So our orientation program, any of you who work in an institution, organization, school, business, know that when you are onboarded, you learn about the culture of the place. You learn about who you're working with. You get to know each other. You got to trust each other, you know? But you can't trust someone who you don't know and they make it hard to get to know each other. So we're gonna do the little things and the big things and simply try to get Americans to start working together again. And that's what the Modernization Committee is uh, focused on more than anything. This is a blank card. Well, those are my favorite questions. No, there's no freebies in Washington. Sherry Powers from Burnsville asks, the ARP funds sent to states aren't being used for small businesses who have been truly devastated by the pandemic. As it stands right now, businesses who received county or state relief back in October 2020 won't qualify for COVID relief. This is an unconscionable action on the part of the state to not set up COVID relief for small businesses based on revenue loss, especially with the $3.3 billion surplus in the state right now. That's what the ARP is for, COVID relief. And I agree. Uh, in fact, you'll be, whoever wrote the question, you'll be pleased to know that I'm sending a letter literally right now uh, to our state leaders to very strongly encourage that we use some of these resources to support the very small businesses that have been most affected. Uh, the money is there. Uh, I think it's important we do so. Uh, you all know that we, we started the PPP program, uh, which considering how little time we had and, and very few mechanisms to get money to businesses, uh, quickly, expeditiously, and also uh, with integrity. Uh, I think it worked as well as it humanly could. Uh, you all probably know that uh, it was my bill that made it work a lot better, the PPP Flexibility Act uh, that I did with Chip Roy, who was the 427th most bipartisan member of Congress. But, uh, <laughs> but the whole point is we work together. Uh, you know, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund has been a total disaster. The very small businesses that we intended to help the most are the ones being punished now because of lawsuits uh, and a lack of a, a system to get the money in the right hands. Uh, if any of you are small business owners that have not had access to resources, please let our office know so I can do something to try to help. I serve on the Small Business Committee. I chair the Oversight Committee, uh, Subcommittee of Small Business. This is my primary focus right now, is ensuring that we ensure we know where the money went, if it was misused or it was fraudulent, that we uncover that. And perhaps even more importantly, is to ensure that those businesses who have not been able uh, to get the support they deserve and need, that we do so. I'm not giving up. And even though you know, the economy is starting to open fast and things are starting to boom in a lot of categories, I know there's been inequity in how the money has been shared. And it should not be government's job to pick winners and losers. And some businesses got money, some got too much, some got too little, some took advantage of it and were shamed and had to send it back. And I, my sad belief is that there's billions out there that were misused and we've got to find it and we will. But rest assured, I'm encouraging at the state level, you know, there's a lot of money still here, we should distribute it, uh, and even at the federal level, I think we should refill the coffers of the restaurant revitalization program, uh, uh, stages, and some of the other businesses. Also, gyms, you know, the businesses most affected by the COVID shutdowns. Uh, that's how, that's by the way, why we're in the position we're in right now, with a booming economy again. Uh, because the money, for the most part, worked, but not everywhere, and I acknowledge that and we're working to fix it. John Prynne from Eden Prairie. 
Will the Voting Act for the People pass? Are Dems working to pass it? Schumer seems passive. Will our democracy survive? Our democracy will survive as long as all of you and the rest of us participate. Yes, it will. It's a very difficult time, uh, made terribly more difficult because of misinformation, and that's just the truth. Uh, the For the People Act, H.R. 1, will not pass as it is right now. There's not a chance. Uh, it, it's, it's been made clear by um, you know, Republicans that it's, it's going nowhere. Uh, that said, um, I don't think that, that we should just then give up. So I've started a working group in our Problem Solvers Caucus. Many of you know I'm the vice chair uh, of the only working bipartisan group in Congress that actually does develop policy, the, the Problem Solvers. Uh, we're 28 Democrats and 28 Republicans. I'm the vice chair. Uh, the Republican co-chair, Brian Fitzpatrick, and I are co-leading a working group to identify the elements of the For the People um, you know, bill, a package, uh, on which there's agreement. And about 70%, I'd say, there is agreement on it. And I would argue we should at least pass what we can. Uh, Democrats will have to give a little uh, on voter ID, I think is a perfect example. Uh, but we've got to standardize uh, some of the, the electoral issues. We cannot allow those who lack integrity at the state level to literally change the outcome of federal elections. We have to ensure that those who wish to vote can do so. <laughs> but for a handful of very principled Republican secretaries of state, whose lives and careers in many cases are now over because of their integrity, because of them, to your question about will democracy survive, we will owe it to them. History should treat them uh, with the celebration that they deserve, no matter what you think of their politics. That's the truth, too. And we have to ensure, we have to codify uh, that in the future so that we don't witness what happened on January 6th. And I was in the chamber that day and thousands of people came to disrupt the most integral, uh, honorable, important element of our entire system of governance, and that is certification of our presidential elections. Uh, we should agree on that, Democrats and Republicans, because the pendulum of politics will always swing. And who knows what party might be in the White House when we uh, witness something like this again. So we should ensure integrity, we can do so. I promise you I'm gonna work my tail off to come up with something that could pass both chambers of Congress and be signed into law because we have got to do something. And to those of you in the audience who have lost faith in the elections, who believe the last election was fixed or a sham or something, uh, I understand why you might feel like that. I disagree with the underlying facts because the facts don't support it, but I understand why you might feel like that. And that alone, that alone is reason for us to do something at the federal level because if you don't have faith in our elections, you don't have faith in America. And that is our responsibility in Congress, to ensure that you do. And that's why I do think we have to ensure that you can trust the people behind our elections, and you can trust the machinery, the system, and ultimately the outcome. Uh, that's my responsibility. That's an apolitical statement. Uh, so yes, we will work on that. I promise you, you will see a work product, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, I can't promise you it'll pass, but I do promise you it's gonna be a significant effort. And as the President said the other day, you know, what we're seeing happen in states around this country uh, is quite frightening, uh, for lack of a better term. It's quite frightening. And we should all be lucky to live in a state like Minnesota with some of the best run elections in the entire country, a model for America. And that's what we're going to use as a guide. Nicole from Bloomington asks, is Congress truly as partisan and harsh as the media highlights suggest? Or is that sadly, for show or for votes. And she adds in parentheses, please give me hope in government. I'm still young and have decades left to watch. I'm gonna, I'm, I hope I made your night by saying this. It's not nearly what is portrayed on Twitter and on TV. And I remind you, I remind you, the people that you see on the evening cable shows and the opinion shows, the ones whose faces you know very well on the right and the left, they do not represent the United States Congress. I promise you. Most people treat each other with great respect and decency. You know, my very best friend in Congress is a Republican. I won't say his name because sadly, it'll probably hurt him. It's sad. I'm gonna have another Republican friend come to Minnesota this August. We're gonna go to the State Fair. We're gonna go around the third district and we're gonna show everybody in our district how decent, how friendly, 
even if we differ in opinions on some political issues, you know, how Americans should be doing this. So the answer is no, it's not as bad as it seems. And I'm really heartbroken by the fact that our entire country thinks that our entire government is a total disaster. There are some people in Congress that are total disasters. They're an embarrassment to the institution and to the country, yes. But the fact is most are not. Uh, and the sad, sadder truth is that most of those people who have integrity, uh, even if they frustrate each other, including you know, me, them, they're not the ones you see on TV. You don't hear about the Problem Solvers Caucus. You don't hear about the Modernization Committee. You don't hear about the bipartisan work going on. You don't hear about the overwhelming number of times that Democrats and Republicans vote together. I voted with Pete Stopper 800 times in the last Congress. You wouldn't know that. You'll only hear about the ones that are the real divisive votes. So the truth is it's not as bad. And I'm terribly concerned that we have a, a media industry uh, that thrives on angertainment. I like to call it angertainment because that's exactly what it is. It makes us angry. I've been really working to not watch evening cable news, and it's been helpful lately. Because I know, even look at MSNBC, you know, I understand, it made me angry. And I watch Fox News regularly too, so I understand what's being fed you know, to, to those who watch Fox News. I watch Newsmax sometimes, my goodness, you have to watch these things to understand, right? But for the most part, we have a, we have a media industry that now thrives by division. And if they don't antagonize the other side, they lose viewership and they lose advertisers and they go out of business. So this is up to us. It really is. Don't believe everything you see. I promise you it's not as bad. And don't let the handful of creeps on either side dictate what you think about our country and about our Congress. If anything, we should disenfranchise them and stop this, stop this extremism that's what's dangerous to America. And the fact is a good 80% of our country, including I bet most of you in this room, simply want to see your money used thoughtfully, efficiently, effectively. You, know, you want to have your freedom to make good choices for yourself. You want, to, you want to ensure our country is safe and you have opportunity and economic security. And that your kids are well educated. You know, that's I think what most of us want and that's what most in Congress do. Steve Schilber from Maple Grove asks, please discuss the plans to address the true urgency of climate change. Well, you know, if you see what's going on right now in, in the West, I, I don't know about all of you, you know, I, we've been seeing and, and hearing the drumbeat, of course, about climate change. You know, and again, whether you believe it's man-made or not, I think you know, the facts would indicate that we are participants in this crisis, probably not the only participants, part of it natural, but the fact is the fact. The climate is changing, and it's changing rapidly. It has done so um, eons past, and it has affected the ability of a number of species to even continue to live. I'm not worried about Earth surviving. I'm worried about humanity surviving. And what we're seeing in the West right now with that heat dome is shocking. And let me assure you, my Republican and Democratic friends from that part of the country are more shocked than anybody else, the people that come from those places. Um, it's going to cause water to be such a precious commodity that I expect that there could be international conflicts over water, which makes us once again very lucky to be in Minnesota. But if you look at what's happening in the West with the water table and the water levels, we have a major crisis on our hands. I would argue that government's role should be first to decide if we care enough about the future and about our children and grandchildren to act. You know, most of us in our lifetime, I think we're gonna be fine, but I'm worried about my daughters who are 23 and 21 and their children because if we don't try to do something, I guarantee you, we're gonna see horrific conflict over precious resources uh, and we may have an earth that is uninhabitable for human beings if we don't try to do something. And we can't do it alone. You know, we gotta work with some of our adversaries. We have to work with our allies. You know, this is, this is where the nations must unite. You know, lay down the bullets and the missiles and the guns and let's at least try to preserve ourselves. We should do that first and foremost. We have to create incentives to change our behaviors. You know, I don't like the Line 3 pipeline. But I imagine most of you came here in a car that is powered by gasoline. 
And I sure as heck don't want to see pipeline spills because we have 40-year-old infrastructure that is, that, is, that is leaking. And I also hate the fact that it goes through you know, tribal lands. I hate all of that. I, wish we, I hope we never have to build another pipeline again. But that's government's job, to provide incentives to change our behavior. I believe in carbon fee and dividend. I think we should put a fee on carbon because it's costing us dearly. And we should return that money to the people that pay it. That's why it's called carbon fee and dividend. That way, we create, we create an incentive to migrate away from carbon fuels. We should use production tax credits like we do for wind energy. Wind is now the least expense, expensive form of energy in the United States of America. 20 years ago, it was just the opposite. But it's because we gave incentives to businesses to invest and innovate. That's what, that's what government should do. It shouldn't mandate everything. Give incentives for the behavior that is in the collective best interest, the common good for our country, and now the world. This is not domestic policy. If we're able to pass uh, the Biden administration's um, new budget plan that was just released in the last couple of days, without a lot of details, mind you, but a big component of that uh, is relative to climate. Investing in our electrical grid, you saw what happened in Texas. You know, as we, as we migrate to clean energy, we need to change our grid. We need to ensure that, uh, there are, that electric cars are affordable and that you can charge them. We need to ensure that there are incentives to change our behavior. We should reward that good behavior. We gotta work with countries around the world to do that. Uh, and we gotta get to work. Because we've been talking about this for decades, and now the evidence is before our eyes. And it is horrifying, and I don't mean to scare you all, but it is horrifying. And we're among the luckiest where we are located right here. I can't tell you, coming home, coming home to 70 some degree weather this morning, I have not felt 70 degree weather, and I can't tell you how long since you know, being in Washington for a boat in the last month, where it's 95 and it's horrifyingly humid every single day. And in the West, it's burning. And I come home and it's actually okay for the first time I know a little bit. But we're lucky, we've got the Great Lakes, we've got the rivers, we've got water. Let me tell you, not everybody's so lucky, and we've got to do something. And I, you know, one more thing. John Curtis, uh, my Republican friend from Utah, a leader, an emerging leader in climate change activism because he sees what's happening in Utah. He started last, two weeks ago, a conservative climate caucus. And lo and behold, to his great surprise, he attracted 67 Republicans to join the conservative climate caucus. This is becoming actually a very bipartisan issue. And now we've got to come together on the solutions, and America should, could lead, should lead. And if we do it right, we're going to create entirely new industries with high-paying jobs that will actually help stimulate our economy, which is a win-win-win for everybody. Jim Fredko from Minnetonka asks, why do our federal dollars continue to subsidize all been rebuilt for many years? Why do they still need the extra money? Minnesota needs it. Well, the answer is Mitch McConnell. <laughs> but I, I'm really glad you asked that. Many of you know that, I, and I, I publicize this regularly. I'm really sick and tired of Minnesota subsidizing other states. I'm really sick and tired of Minnesota sending more money to Washington than we ever did that. I'm sick and tired of Minnesota losing out on every single major federal investment, whether it be an FDA, you know, regional headquarters, or, or you know, military you know, installations, uh, cybersecurity, research centers, you name it. We don't get a lot here. And we don't get a lot is because we actually take care of Minnesotans in ways that most states don't. And it really bothers me. Uh, my friends on the Problem Solvers Caucus like to call those other states the moocher states. You know, low tax states, you know, they fight to keep the taxes low in Mississippi and Kentucky and, you know, Alabama. And if you look at their school systems, and if you look at what life is like there compared to here, you understand what you get. Not a lot of good value. But they mooch from us. They take the money from the federal coffers, Medicaid, you know, and all the benefits and all the support programs and, and all the federal, you know, installations. And I'm not saying that we should get more than them. But I do care about equity. I care about racial equity. I care about economic equity. I care about geographic equity as it relates to individuals and also states. Uh, and I'm troubled by it. And I'm trying real hard right now to point that out. There's a lot of inequity. And the irony is that we are subsidizing the low tax states and we pay more. And we know that. And now Minnesota is still a better place to live than just about any state in the country, I would argue. But I don't think it's that much better compared to what we're paying. I think the value proposition is getting a little bit out of whack to be forthright. 
And I tell you, I say that because I know what the property tax is on a home of equal value in Washington, D.C., as I do in Minnesota, and it will shock you. So my contention is if we're going to pay these extra dollars, those dollars should at least stay here and make our lives better for Minnesotans and not be subsidizing states that are unwilling to tax those who are successful in enterprises and the like, and that's what's happening right now. And Mitch McConnell does a fine job of representing his state of Kentucky in ways that I can't even begin to articulate, you can imagine. But when you have that much power concentrated in the hands of a few in Congress, Democrats or Republicans, rest assured, you'll know where the money's gonna flow. Uh, and Minnesota has got to work harder. I'm encouraging my delegation, Democrats and Republicans, to start working together and unify to bring more money home, or at least perhaps uh, overturn that SALT you know, deduction change that was, a, to me, a massive impediment to people in the third district. Average is $17,000 per, per filing. Uh, you know, that's the kind of that's the kind of tax policy that really disadvantages Minnesotans, and I want to address it, and I'm working on it. Jay Shahidi from St. Louis Park asks, "Would you be supportive of, of Attorney General Ellison's lawsuit against some oil companies?" Well, first, St. Louis Park is not in the third district. I need to point that out. Uh, and what was the question? Ellison, supportive of, of Ellison's lawsuit against some oil companies. Against who? Oil companies? Oh. I, I, I'm not familiar specifically with the law. I'll tell you what, um, it's really important to me that people in the third district get their questions answered, and I, and I apologize. Um, but as for the lawsuit, I'm not terribly familiar with it, so I don't, I don't want to opine. I don't know. Um, but let's move to the next question. And I love St. Louis Park. And I wish St. Louis Park was in the third district, and who knows, maybe after redistricting it will, and then I would be thrilled <laughs> to answer your question. Diane Ething from Eden Prairie, which is in the third district, asks, uh, there are immediate issues that need attention, such as the pandemic and voting rights. I'm wondering if there's a discussion to develop laws to prevent the abuses of our government, such as no person is above the law. You can be charged with, a criminal, con uh, with criminal conduct even if you are president using the Department of Justice to pursue the President's interests to be the President's personal attorney. We must put checks and balances in place before the next election. Well, we have checks and balances in place. And that's why this last couple years has been so challenging for so many in our country, is even with these extraordinary checks and balances in place, so well conceived, you know, 200, almost 40 years ago, uh, tested over the years, of course, but what we fail to recognize is that the system can be extraordinary. And I really think we have an extraordinary system. But if it's not populated with the people that we need of integrity and principle, who put country over party and politics, you know, who will never sacrifice their own principles in favor of somebody else, uh, if we don't have those people, all is lost. So to the young people in this room, I hope you run for office someday. I hope you run, because if we entrust it to just the others, if you will, if public service becomes something that's so difficult and so convenient and so hard and caustic that nobody wants to do it anymore, we're gonna be entrusting our government to the least capable and the least principled, the people that will use those positions of power uh, to their own benefit. And that's not a political statement, that's just a human statement, that's what happens. So I'm troubled. I get a lot of people saying, why don't you do something? You know, in the last couple of years, why don't you do something? Well, we tried. We tried. And I abide by the laws, and I respect our system. I'm not willing to violate the tenets of that system, even in the face of overt, horrific corruption. Not everybody feels the same way, but the good news is, I'm seeing a change right now in the types of people that are leading the agencies and in the Justice Department, uh, and I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable right now. But we can't take that for granted, and that will not be perpetual. And I ask all of you to give thought to what role you can play in either running for an office or, or promoting integrity and good governance and clean governance, because we've learned firsthand in the last number of months that how even the most well-conceived system in the world is still imperfect, especially if not populated by people of integrity. And it's as simple as that. We have no name or city on this question, but the question is, uh, this person is concerned about runaway spending. What can be done 
to avoid passing debt to future generations. Yeah, so I, I remember being a teenager, and I don't remember the context, but I remember, I think we had like a $900 billion federal debt when I was like a, in high school, during the Reagan era. Like I, I think it was $900 billion, maybe a trillion. You know, and how that was gonna burden my generation one day with you know, insurmountable you know, debt, and uh, we're gonna bankrupt the country, and, and lo and behold, here we are, you know, 40 years later, and now we have almost $30 trillion in debt. It's astounding, the number, $30 trillion. But I will, I will argue that it is not so much the debt load that we have incurred that is troublesome, it's the debt service. It's the interest that we're paying on that debt every year. Some of you might know we are now exceeding $400 billion a year on the debt service. So the holders of the debt to whom we pay interest cost us $400 billion a year. We spend $750 billion a year on our national defense, which by the way is just military because we can't defend ourselves against viruses or cyber attacks, obviously. $750 billion, you add, a, you add up, that's almost, a, that's over a trillion, about one and a quarter trillion dollars a year that we're not spending on children, on education, on infrastructure, on healthcare. That's what China's doing. That's what our great competitors around the world are doing right now. So I'm troubled by that. And the, answer, the question, the court, and we're about to probably spend more, there's no question. Now I think long term, it probably will be in the country's best interest. Certainly spending during COVID uh, to get our country through it was important. The Trump administration added $7 trillion in debt to our loan. $7 trillion, okay? This is the conservative party. Okay, the, the liberal party, if it fulfills its, uh, or some of its um, uh, policy uh, mission, will probably incur about that same amount too. So I'm not gonna accept the fact that, well, you know, the Republicans are, are, are fiscally responsible. That's just not true. It's just not true. And nor are Democrats. And we've got to start matching our revenues with our needs. Some of you might see it differently, but the fact is, I've done some homework on this, we're among the lowest taxed people in prosperous nations around the entire world. We are. And gosh knows, I think we all pay a little bit too much in tax, but the fact is, we don't pay as much as most countries. And the, the most successful in America certainly don't. The three wealthiest individuals in the United States of America control more wealth than the bottom 64% of our entire nation. So you ask, how are we gonna do this? I have a real simple way to do this. People who've generated great success in this country have done so not alone. Some of them like to think they did. But they did it because they had a great teacher. They did it because the roads that brought their products to market were paved, right? They did it because the country in which they built their business has a strong national defense and has good economic policy that creates the conditions for success. People should be honored to pay to continue this great experiment. And we have to turn to them. I don't want to see corporate taxes go back to the way they were. We should be competitive. But they never should have come down as far as they did. And one of the great propositions in the Biden administration's um, um, social infrastructure plan is to invest $40 billion in the IRS so that we can collect $400 billion that are going un, uh, unsubmitted because of tax fraud. They're using archaic computers. They don't have enough people. That means stock laws that some of the wealthiest in our country with great advisors can basically pay almost no tax. You know it, you see it in the news every day. So I think it's just about fairness. I think I should pay more tax. I've been really lucky. I'm privileged. Some because of my hard work and some because of people that came before me. And I think everybody in this country, whether they made it from pulling up their own bootstraps or whether it was handed to them, those of great success have got to share more collectively. We should be thrilled to do so. And that's how we're gonna do better. We're gonna match paying more of those who can and should with investing more in those who can't. Because though one day will come when all these kids right now who are going to sleep hungry, who have no access to good education, who have no parent modeling the behavior that we all wish they did, that so many of us got to enjoy as a blessing growing up. 
Those kids, one day, if we invest in them, will make all of this a lot easier to pallet because our economy will expand, we'll have more taxpayers, and less people that we have to take care of. Our Coleman from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve quantified it better than anybody else 20 years ago. If we invest in kids, we will spend so much less down the road, incarcerating them, treating them for addictions, paying for their housing, for their welfare. So that's how we're gonna do this, I think. And we should have a national conversation about it. And I think we can do that, we should do that. Uh, and it's gonna take both parties to come together uh, and have that conversation. I hope to be at the table and lead it because uh, we've gotta to look to the rest of the world and realize we are being outmaneuvered by countries that are investing more in their people. So the debt, back to the real the original question, 30 trillion is extraordinary. I hope after these great investments, we start taking a breath and start focusing on how we pay that down so that we can start spending that 400 billion now that's going to interest to actually investing in human beings. That's what I think we need to do. I said I would ask the last question at 710, it is now 713. And I promised we would get out on here. Remember the M&M thing. Remember that, everybody. Oh, sir. Uh, so I will ask one final question. This is from Patrick McClellan from Bloomington. Today, 50,000 Minnesotans have lost their Second Amendment rights because they use medical cannabis. Will you help us restore our rights? Yes. Now, that, that makes me sick, by the way. The fact that the United States of America in 2021 still classifies cannabis as a Schedule I narcotic is asinine. Asinine. You know, I, I, I spent part of my career in the distilled spirits business. We were known for our campaign of enjoy and moderation because we recognized how dangerous alcohol is when it's abused. And let me tell you, alcohol is more dangerous when it's abused than cannabis. And yes, I have inhaled. <laughs> and having done so, I can tell you from experience that we are the most hypocritical nation on earth right now as it, as it relates to our drug laws, I would argue. We are making something illegal at the federal level and letting states legalize it at the state level. You know, we still have people sitting in jail for years for selling a joint when you have people becoming gajillionaires doing the exact same thing in states around the country. If that isn't un-American, I do not know what is. And by the way, you know, I would argue you know, to, to lose your access to own a firearm because you're using medical marijuana is absurd. So you can go, you can go pound a bottle of Jack Daniels and then go get your gun permit. Give me a break. Come on. So you might hear a little bit of a libertarian in me, but I think it's enough already. I think it's time that we take cannabis off Schedule 1. We allow research to finally be conducted on it. This is not cocaine and heroin and, and LSD and stuff. This is cannabis. Grows naturally, has medicinal properties. We can't even research it because it's on Schedule 1. We should declassify it, let states regulate it and do it the way they want. Because every state will do it differently. The same way we did alcohol. Prohibition doesn't work. And let's start treating addictions as health issues, not criminal issues. My goodness. <laughs> it's just common sense, which is a great way to wrap this up. I wish there was a common sense party. Back to your question. You know, because that's the party I would affiliate with. There are too many times where my own party seems to lack it. And over the last number of years, the last few years, I'm really dismayed at the other party lack of common sense and common good. But each party has a heritage of decency and some real bad stuff. So common sense, common good, common ground. There's no better way to end this first return to the stage in front of all of you than those words. And I ask when you go home tonight, as angry as you might be, as fearful about some things as you might be, you recognize there's still no better country in which to live. There's no better time in which to live and no better place than where we are right now. And if we all take that spirit of gratitude home and start spreading it a little bit, uh, I think we're gonna be just fine. And I have high hopes, and I will close with this. I have a lot of young kids write to me, email me, send me the letters and clippings of articles with notes. 
Um, I'll start getting back into classrooms because that's one of the best parts of this job. When I'm invited to high schools by the conservative club, and I see the respect with which they treat me and how we talk about issues, and how they do it oftentimes with the Democratic Club or the Liberal Club. I think to myself, you know, why is it that kindergartners and high schoolers are, are living the very principles that those in Congress seem to be so unable to do themselves sometimes? And I would say that leadership matters. And every one of you in this room is a leader, uh, an influencer. And I think we can all do a little something to take it down a notch and share a little bit of love and pay a little bit of opportunity forward and recapture you know, what I consider to be the essence of America, which is respect and opportunity and freedom and decency. Uh, and that's the common ground I'm seeking. And I love you all. I wish you Godspeed. I can't wait to see you again. And we have more questions. Enjoy your friends. Bye, everybody.